Good morning and thank you all for being here today. It's great to be with President Hester, House Pro Tem, and many of our other partners and leaders in the legislature. Kind of feels like we're getting the gang all back together again, which is kind of fun. It's been a little too quiet in these hallways. I also want to thank several members of my cabinet, as well as a few of Arkansas's constitutional officers, Lieutenant Governor Leslie Rutledge, Commissioner Tommy Land, and Treasurer Larry Walther for also joining us and being part of this day today. When I took this office, I promised to limit the growth of government before government could limit the growth of liberty. To achieve that, today I'm calling a special session of the legislature, beginning next Monday focused on three things cutting taxes, streamlining state government, and protecting our freedom. It's no secret around the Capitol that tax cuts will be our top priority. Arkansas has Tennessee on one side and Texas on the other. Both are zero income tax states, making it hard sometimes for Arkansas to be competitive. And with President Biden's big government policies, making it even harder for people to make ends meet, Every Arkansan needs a little extra money in their pocket. The legislation we're introducing will cut taxes by even more than we did in the regular session. By the time our lawmakers return home next Wednesday, we will have permanently shaved $250 million off of annual personal income taxes and $58 million off of annual corporate income taxes. This lowers our personal income tax rate to 4.4% and our corporate income tax rate to 4.8%, but that's not all we're doing. We will also offer up to $150 in immediate one-time tax relief to about 1 million middle-class taxpayers, making less than $90,000 a year. And we will create the Arkansas Reserve Fund and fill it with $710 million to keep responsibly phasing out the income tax entirely. These tax cuts go a long way towards shrinking government, but they're just one piece of the puzzle. To make our government smaller, we have to make it more efficient. To do so, we will also update Arkansas's Freedom of Information Act. Arkansas FOIA laws have been largely unchanged since they were signed in 1967. In a time before email, cell phones, text messages, and sadly, before some of the more aggressive polarization that we see across our country today. Arkansas has some of the most transparent FOIA laws in the country, and these reforms will do nothing to change that. But some are weaponizing FOIA and taking advantage of our laws to hamper state government and enrich themselves. They don't care about transparency. They wanna waste taxpayer dollars, slow down our bold conservative agenda, and frankly, put my family's lives at stake. The last point is very personal. I had to deal with credible death threats when I was in the White House, becoming the first White House press secretary in the history of our country to require Secret Service protection, something that is generally reserved for the president, the vice president, and their families. When I was campaigning for this office, we had violent people track our movements to try to do us harm. A man near Russellville was arrested for threatening to shoot me. And just last month, a man in Oklahoma pled guilty for trying to kill me. Our current FOIA laws put me and my kids at risk. So we will update sections of the law so that the sources and methods Arkansas State Police uses to protect me and my family outside of the governor's mansion are not subject to disclosure. This will function the same as current law which makes it so that those same sources and methods used within the, within the grounds of the mansion cannot be released. In keeping with our mission of transparency, we will also add a requirement that on a quarterly basis, Arkansas State Police will prepare a report for the legislature that aggregates the cost of security for the first family. We are also updating our laws to the same standard that the federal government uses to keep internal deliberations in the executive branch exempt from FOIA. Right now, a Chinese state-owned company operating in Arkansas could use their employees to FOIA for internal government documents. Somebody suing the state of Arkansas can FOIA our attorneys to determine our legal strategy. 
That's not just crazy. It's a waste of taxpayer resources. We will end this practice and bring Arkansas in line with federal law and the laws of other states, ranging from New York and California to Oklahoma and Alabama. Lower taxes and more efficient government are our goals, and they are certainly good, but they are not enough. We also have to be sure that government never again tramples on our liberty like it did during the COVID-19 pandemic. Back then, a handful of bureaucrats shut down our schools, our churches, our businesses, and forced masks on our kids and tried to implement vaccine passports. That will not happen again here in the state of Arkansas. When I took office, I repealed a long list of executive orders related to the pandemic. Now we're going further and banning COVID-19 vaccine mandates for all Arkansas state employees. And our State Department of Health will publicize the potential risks related to the COVID-19 vaccine so that all Arkansans can make informed decisions about their health. Cutting taxes, improving efficiency, and expanding liberty. That's what this legislative session is about. After a successful regular session, I never said that we would sit back and rest and do nothing. We're gonna to continue to make big changes. We're rejecting the status quo and we're making this government better because that's what the people of Arkansas deserve. I know that there are probably a lot of questions and I'll be happy to take those after we bring up a couple of our legislative partners to make a few comments. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Governor, and also thank you to my or to the leadership both in the House and the Senate for the continued commitment to making sure that we're competitive uh, in Arkansas on our income tax rates here in the state, both for our working families and also for our job creators. And so I think that's demonstrated mostly through the three tenths reduction that is ongoing. But one thing I do want to focus on is the governor's commitment to helping working families here in the state. And I think that's why it's imperative that we were able to add this $150 uh, credit, also uh, doubles up to $300 for a uh, married couple uh, into this tax bill. That is, just make note, retroactive to the first of this year, and so we will be more immediately feeling the benefit of that here in the state. There's not a whole lot we can do uh, you know, with the nonsensical economic policies that are coming out of D.C. right now, but we can do something, and I think this is a responsible step for us to take again to help those working families that honestly feel like they're, you know, they have their feet out in, underneath them and figuring it out, and it's cut out all over again based on what's coming out again out of D.C. So again, I thank you for your commitment, and also thank you for my colleagues for uh, joining in on the effort. So as the governor mentioned, in addition to the tax cuts, there will be legislation to update, modernize the FOIA law. I just want to briefly outline the four components of that, the four major components of that bill. First and foremost, we are going to take action to protect our governor, her safety, the safety of her family through uh, executive protection and security. The reason that executive protection security exists is because Individuals, through the nature of their job, operate at a higher level of risk personal to their personal safety. And it is unacceptable that we would expose uh, our governor or any of our constitutional officers in that way. So we're going to do that. We're going to create a more reasonable standard for attorney's fees that can be recovered in FOIA lawsuits. We're going to adopt uh, attorney-client privilege so that the state is not inherently at a disadvantage in lawsuits so that um, they can't bypass discovery and immediately obtain the state's legal strategy to defend important laws that we pass, like LEARNS, like the SAFE Act, like many others. And then we're going to add in a level of deliberative process that is mirrored on the federal FOIA law and that will enable our state to continue moving forward uh, continue adopting bold conservative policies and allow some level of deliberative process for pre-decisional um, measures such as that. So I look forward to filing this bill later today and working with my colleagues in the legislature to pass it. Thank you.
Thank you, David and Jonathan, for your leadership, as well as all of our uh, legislative partners who have been tremendous during both the regular session and know we'll have a continued great working relationship. So thank you for the work you're doing. And with that, we'll open up for questions. Damila. Let me start with the first part of your question. On the security part, anytime you're exposing sources, methods, and patterns, then you're allowing and opening yourself up to vulnerability. But that's not my determination. Neither you nor I are security experts. I don't even pretend to be one on TV. However, I'm taking the advice and the guidance of people who that's their full-time job, is to make an assessment, look at vulnerabilities when it comes to security, and a determination and advice on how best to do their job. The Arkansas State Police and the Executive Protection Detail are statutorily obligated to protect uh, me, my family, and other constitutional officers, and this is a determination that they've made that reveals the way that they do that. Absolutely. It's ridiculous to act as if this is some massive radical change. We are literally mirroring federal language that was upheld by a Supreme Court decision of seven to two, a bipartisan decision. We are taking that language and almost copying verbatim into state law. It's also similar to uh, more than a dozen other states that have these same protections. When this law was passed in 1967, the devices that you have sitting in front of you and most of the ones that are in people's pockets around the room didn't even exist. We are inhibiting our government's ability to be efficient and modernizing and stifling innovation here in the executive branch. For instance, uh, one of the specific examples that we've seen is if the state is recruiting a new business to come into Arkansas and one of their competitors can simply FOIA their strategy in which to do so, it puts us at an unfair advantage. The idea that we would have no ability to act pre-decisional is totally crazy and out of line with what is taking place in most states around the country as well as the federal government. Again, by revealing the sources, the methods, the patterns that are used in order to protect an individual, uh, you're putting that person in vulnerability. If they know you travel with two people versus four people or six people and you take this route versus this one or you fly specifically on this airline versus another one, you're revealing the way in which they do their job. Again, this isn't an assessment or determination that I've made myself. This is by people who are experts in their field and have made uh, the assessment that this is the best way to protect both me and my family as well as other constitutional officers. I mean, I, I think it's hard to go through, like, from here, case by case, every single example. But if we are in the deliberative process, in the decision-making process, where we're still in discussion, um, the idea that somebody couldn't throw out an idea and have that discussed and even dismissed without it hitting the front page of the paper really stifles and inhibits our ability as a government to function and to be innovative. It would keep anybody from wanting to raise up uh, an innovative or different idea for sake of being on the front page of the paper and eviscerated uh, for simply suggesting something might be possible. Uh, 
I, it would depend on what the final decision looked like. I mean, you'd have to walk through this step-by-step -step process. Uh, there would be some, if the decision was completely thrown out, then it's possible that it wouldn't be subject to FOIA. Well, not just the legislature. I mean, there are a lot of executive actions that are done without the legislature as well. Well, because the premise of your question is completely wrong. We're not hiding anything. Again, we are trying to add government efficiency. If you think about when this law was passed in 1967, a deliberative process probably took place in a room like this. In fact, many conversations did take place in a room like this. There wasn't the back and forth uh, electronic communication that even existed. You couldn't have a conversation in the same way today that you do uh, at that point when the law was passed for simply modernizing it and bringing it into the 21st century. Again, this isn't some like radical idea. It literally mirrors federal language that was supported in a bipartisan fashion. Absolutely not. Again, there's a number of areas where they would still have the ability to FOIA uh, records, expenses, all those things are still public record and available for any citizen across the state or frankly outside of to have access to. Which ones are you specifically? The, the 250 million? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Jonathan probably has it in his head. If you have a specific <laughs> question, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer it for you. Did you have a follow? Okay. Yeah. No. So I mean, it's roughly 150 million on the three tenths reduction for individual, 35 million or so, I think, for the uh, corporate, and it's 155 million uh, for the one-time credit that's retroactive. Well, if you look, one, at what takes place uh, both through the Secret Service as well as other executive pr protection details in states around the country, we're actually going a step further than most states by providing that aggregate cost of uh, expense to protect the first family. A lot of states provide nothing at all. Frankly, Arkansas doesn't provide that right now, so that's an additional transparency that we've added in this legislation. But it's also an assessment that was done by outside security company as well as the Arkansas State Police. I can't imagine that a threat assessment would be available so that you could see every vulnerability that might exist. That seems irresponsible to me. I mean, I know there are pieces of legislation, there are individual members that I've talked to that have not asked for financial impact studies uh, from DFNA and other things similar when it goes to business recruitment that people have stopped some of those communications because of the ability to FOIA and stifling that. Take one more question. Uh, I'll take the retroactive piece first. That's only specific to the security component, and that's largely due to, again, the patterns that would have been used in the previous administration or similar to this one. There was also a significant amount of conversation uh, during the campaign because both myself as well as the Democrat nominee would be the first governors to take office uh, in decades that have young children, and so the dynamics and the protections that would be in place would have been very different uh, regardless of who won that race, uh, given the fact that young children would be under the executive protection detail for the first time in a long time. 
Uh, this legislation isn't about any one particular person. It's about protecting the vulnerabilities within our law, stopping the weaponizing and harassment uh, that, frankly, is what FOIA is being used for in some cases right now, and making our government more modern and more efficient, something that we pledged to do and talked about extensively uh, during the two years I spent on the campaign. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.